Hello everyone, my name is Tiago and today I'd like to share with you some of the work we have been doing here at ARM to expand the simulation capabilities of GEM5. More specifically, I will present the implementation of a highly configurable cache coherency protocol for the Ruby memory system. Let's start by setting the context for this work. When we look at the landscape for infrastructure SOCs, and by infrastructure I mean servers, cloud, and HPC, we see that the number of cores in a single die is currently in the range of 32 to 64 cores, and this is expected to increase. And the question now is, are we able to use Gen5 to explore this landscape? Um, can Gen5 produce meaningful simulation results when we scale up beyond 32 and 64 cores? For this kind of large SOC design, the availability of good memory subsystem and good on-chip interconnect models plays a major role, and this is what's driving the work that I'm presenting here today. As you may know, Gen5 provides two different approaches for this. The first one is what I call the classic memory subsystem, which provides very flexible models and configurability. For instance, you can model a system with an arbitrary cache hierarchy by just changing some Python configuration files. However, the classic subsystem has some drawbacks. The only type of interconnect available is a hierarchical crossbar and cache coherency simplified and implemented using untimed snoops. This may not lead to many inaccuracies when modeling a small system, but it is not very realistic for large SOCs. On the other hand, we have the Ruby memory subsystem. Ruby provides a flexible on-chip network that can be used to create both crossbar and 2D mesh interconnects, and cache coherency is also modeled in detail with multiple different protocol implementations available. However, Ruby loses a lot of the existing flexibility that we have in Classic. For instance, the cache hierarchy is fixed for each protocol, so if you want to change an existing configuration by adding another cache level, you have to either switch to a different protocol that models that exact cache hierarchy, or you have to modify an existing protocol. If you have worked with Ruby before, you know that these protocols can be very complex and hard to debug, and modifying one of these protocols is not a trivial task. Also, Ruby has lagged behind Classic in some features, such as support for modern prefetchers. So, in this presentation, I'd like to show how we are currently addressing some of these issues. More specifically, I would like to talk about a flexible cache coherence protocol implementation that can be used to model arbitrary cache hierarchies, which will help us close some of the existing gap between Classic and Ruby. The first step in this process is to define a flexible interface and a set of transactions that can support multiple configurations. For this, we looked at ARM's AMBA5 CHI specification. CHI stands for Coherent Hub Interface and is the current standard used in ARM-based SOCs for on-chip communication and cache coherency. This standard provides a component architecture and transaction level specification that can model both Massey and Moesi cache coherency. It also provides both snoop-based and directory-based coherency. CHI defines three main components. First, the request node, which initiates transactions and sends requests towards memory. A request node can be fully coherent which in this figure is abbreviated as RNF, meaning that the request node caches data locally and should respond to snoop requests. Second, the interconnect, which is the responder for the request nodes. Ruby already takes care of the network abstractions for us, so at the protocol level, the interconnect here is just a component that is encapsulating the home nodes of the system. A home node in CHI is the point of coherency for a specific address range and is responsible for processing all memory access requests and issue the required snoops and memory requests to complete a transaction. The home node can also encapsulate a shared last level cache and this includes a directory for targeted snoops. The last component is the slave node, which is basically just an interface to the memory controllers. And there is also a few more components that uh, are omitted here for simplicity. Uh, for example, we also have home nodes for non-coherent address ranges such as IO address ranges and also their respective uh, slave nodes. 
it's for the non-coherent address ranges. Uh, next, CHI specify cache line states. The states are analogous to the MOESI states. So a requester can have the line with either unique or shared access, and the line can be either clean or dirty. The shared line, the shared dirty state is optional, so a requester can avoid transitioning to that state by explicitly requesting a shared clean line. In our particular implementation, each cache controller also has a directory that we define, and we define two directory states. First, UO, which is upstream owner, meaning that a requester has a potentially dirty copy of the line. There is a line that is in either unique dirty, shared dirty, or unique clean state. And the other directory state is US, which means upstream shared, which means that one or more requesters have a shared clean copy of the line. Okay, so let's see a few examples of how our CHI-based protocol works. This first example shows the transaction flow for a load cache miss at a request node. Since there is no intent to modify the line in the request node, the, the requester issues a read shared request. At the home node, there is no valid copy of the line and also there is no valid directory entry. So we fetch the line from memory by issuing a read no snoop to the slave node. The slave node then replies with request completion data. In this case, the memory will always reply with unique clean data, which is encoded in the response type. In this transaction flow, we, we cache the unique clean data at the home node and we send the data to the requester as shared clean. When the requester receives the data, a completion act is sent to the home node, which now updates the directory states to represent the shared state of the line. Alternatively, we could have a home node implementation that does not have a local cache, or the local cache is configured to be non-inclusive towards shared data. For this scenario, CHI allows the slave node to send the data directly to the requester in order to uh, reduce the overall miss latency. This is called DMT or direct memory transfer. And in this case, the requester will always receive the data in the unique clean state. Therefore, it will transition to unique clean. Now let's see another scenario in which the line is present at another request node. First, requester one sends a read share to the home node and after a directory lookup, we note that now requester zero has a potentially dirty copy of the line. So we send a snoop shared forward to requester zero. This request tells the snoopy to transition to a shared state and send a shared copy of the line to requester one. After requester 0 forwards the line to requester 1, which in this case is forwarded as shared dirty, the Snoopy has to send a response to the home node informing that the current state of the informing the current state of the line and the, also the state of the forwarded line. This is encoded here in the Snoop response, which is telling the home node that requester 0 now has the line in shared clean state and the line was forwarded to requester 1 in the shared dirty state. And then after receiving the completion act for the regional requester, the home node can make the appropriate directory updates. Note, notice that this specific behavior uh, describes just one of the possible ways that the home node can snoop the requester zero to complete the read shared. And this depends on the current protocol we wish to model and also on how the cache controllers are configured. For example, if we want a messy behavior and avoid the shared dirty state, we can use different request types. The requester can issue a read not shared dirty instead of a read shared. In this case, requester one will accept a line in any state except shared dirty. Then the home node sends the respective read not shared dirty forward. And as a response, the Snoopy has to forward 
shared clean data to the request to the original requester. And it is in this case the Snoop is also transitioning to the shared clean state. Since all the requesters are now clean, uh, this Snoop has to include the dirty data as part of this Snoop response to the to the home node. And at the home node, we can complete the transaction either by uh, writing back the dirty data to memory or by caching the data locally. And this depends on whether or not we have a cache at the home node or the inclusivity policies set as inclusive towards shared data. So now let's see how this is defined in Ruby. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we want to avoid what the existing Ruby protocols do, which is implementing a separate implementing separate state machines or cache controllers for each level of the cache hierarchy that, that is being modeled. Instead, we want to have a single configurable controller that can be used to model multiple protocol configurations. So we define only two state machines. The first one is the memory controller, which interfaces with the main memory, and the second one is the cache controller. The cache controller always includes a directory and an optional cache and can be configured as the top level L1 cache, an, an intermediate level cache, such as a shared or private L2, or as one of the home nodes of the system. The same controller with the caches disabled can also be used as a DMA controller. In the right side of this line, of this slide, we have a snapshot of the state machine definition that shows the main configuration points that we currently have for the cache controller. The first option selects the mode of operation, either home node or a cache within a request node. Then we have options for uh, configuring the cache as inclusive or non-inclusive, and this can be defined separately for shared and unique data. We also have options for disabling the cache and disabling the shared dirty state, as mentioned before. And we also have a few options for enabling or disabling forwarding of data directly to request nodes. So this was an overview of the new protocol we are working on. We are currently finalizing the implementation and of course we plan to upstream very soon. And so if you're interested, keep an eye on the mailing list for the latest patches. As plans for the future, we would like to keep enabling features from the classic memory system in Ruby, such as proper support for cache maintenance and also prefetchers. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you in the Q&A session.